Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here one more time for String Tech Workstation, Stratford, Ontario, Canada. I have covered this subject in several other videos, the Taylor neck joint and how to properly reset it. I did a little bit of a different take on it this time. just want to take a minute and explain the geometry and how this works. Any of the regular subscribers who've seen me reset the Martin dovetail neck will definitely appreciate and understand what we're about to explain here. So typically, to change the neck angle, we take the material off the tip of the heel and that allows us to tilt the neck back. So when you get this right, and you take just the right amount off here on this tip, it gives you complete control over the action and ultimately playability of the guitar. Okay, let's take a look at this shim method that Taylor uses. Taylor, of course, have a completely different take on this whole neck to body joint. So now, instead of taking that material off the tip of the heel of the actual neck on the inside, you reduce the thickness of the shim on this end. Now, the beauty of this, especially for all you guys that have your uh, radius disc sanders, that's what I use to very quickly reduce the material. Now, you've got to be careful. You can't take too much. We're talking like a millimeter off of the thickness. So I'm going to go over to the disc sander, reduce this thickness, bring it back, then we will set the neck back in place and we'll check the action of the saddle. So the sander, as you know, is operated by a foot switch. And of course, because it's on a drill press, you have quite a bit of control over the speed of the rotation of the disc. I think right now we've got this turning at about uh, 300 RPM. And the beauty of this is it allows you to have complete control to actually have both hands free. I'm putting pressure on the tip because that's the side we want to take down. So we want to go from reducing the tip by about a millimeter right up to this end where we don't reduce it at all. I never have to reach for an on-off switch because I use the air-activated foot switch. I'll turn the dust collector on. That slight difference in the thickness of the shim, thinner here and full thickness here, allows us to reset that neck angle. Now we'll reassemble neck to body, string it up, and we'll check that height of the saddle again. We'll set that back into place. So the, Dan was struggling with this because you know he brought it in to get it set up a couple of times and got it back and it didn't seem to make any difference. Well, this is going to make a huge difference. Now we're ready to put the strings back on and we will test that original saddle and see what it gives us as far as intonation goes. Well, there are a couple of things I'm seeing here that kind of raise the alarm bells a little bit for me. One is this string, look at how close that string is to the bevel on both sides, same thing. But the other thing that I find concerning is the actual space between strings uh, it's not entirely even all the way across. Boy, you think a CNC machine would get that right. This is considerably wider than, say, this. At first I thought, okay, well maybe they, they actually space it logarithmically, but they don't because when I look at the space between the first and second string, it's actually wider than the space between the second and third string. Anyway, we're making a compensated nut anyway, so we're going to take care of that. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and just tune it up and see what we got as far as action goes. So we've got lots of room now. The neck angle is perfect. We're making a compensated nut anyway. And I'm going to bring you back when it's all done. Close up of the bridge saddle. Close up of the nut. So the guitar is now tuned to concert pitch. And another concern has come up. So when I put that straight edge on there. On the treble side, bass side is fine. On the treble side, the neck kind of humps up a little bit here. So we need to back that truss rod off just to verify what exactly I will need to do as far as fret dressing goes to get this thing to be 100%. And that's what it should look like when you get the nut out. Okay, on with the compensated nut. 
And this is the initial press fit that we're looking for. And that's what we want. We've restored the structural integrity of that headstock. Now the headstock flexes, butts up against this, and in turn that deflects against the end of the fingerboard. And the chances of headstock breakage have, have just been reduced drastically. We have a slightly different plan of action here for the Taylor compensated nut because as everybody knows the Taylor guitars tend to be very close right out of the gate. We needed to buy back four cents for the low E string. It was four cents flat so we're bringing it forward or shortening it. This line here represents the end of the fingerboard. So it was really just the sixth string, the fourth string and the first string that all needed to come forward a bit. The second, the third, and fifth, they were fine, perfectly in tune. And I will use the drill press conversion kit sander for that. So let's go do that first. So before we go any further with with the compensated nut and addressing uh, any fret issues, I need to pull the neck off again. Here's our fastener from the underside of the fingerboard, and there's our large heel bolt, the first one. Before I loosen that off, I just I like to kind of strap these tailor necks down so that when it lets go. I'll just hang on to the body. The neck is held by the neck assembly. And there is our second heel bolt. Now, so the shim I'm after is this guy right here. So we are going to thin this down ever so slightly and that will take care of that discrepancy at the top end. Back to the radius disc center. We're just talking a few thou here. A few seconds, a few thou. Okay, mission accomplished. Now we can put this thing back together and now we can do the final torque on those heel bolts. Now, having said that, if you haven't read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Mechanics, you're doing this type of work. Get that book. Read it cover to cover. So you have to remember that what we're talking about here is we're talking about a fairly heavy machine fastener. So you got a metal machine fastener that you're tightening up against wood. Who do you think is going to win? In that book I just mentioned, uh, Zen and the Art of uh, Motorcycle Mechanics, they give an example where, you know, when you're tightening the bolts down on an aluminum block, like a four-year-old could strip every bolt in the engine. So, you know, there comes a point where you just got to decide how much torque is enough. You want it to be snug, but you just you don't want to strip it, obviously. Now we can throw a fresh set of 11 to 52 strings on and we'll tweak that compensated nut. Well, as you can see, the nut blank has been cut and fitted. So just before we cut back these values, the B string, the A string, and the G string will all be cut back to this line which represents the end of the fingerboard. The first string, the fourth string, and the sixth string will be cut back to these marks that I've marked here. And the bass side on this guitar was quite a bit higher, and it should be higher than the treble side, but it was a little bit exaggerated. So we're going to take the saddle out, and from the bottom of the saddle, we're going to take the bass side down, and then we'll be ready to cut these values. Because the crown of the saddle is radiused perfectly to match the fingerboard radius, the material will come off the underside of the saddle. We're going to drop the base side down a little bit. The treble side is pretty good right where it is, so let's get that saddle out. This is the base side. That's how much we're taking off and we're coming down to zero on the treble side. 
and that's what we got now. This is the back side of the saddle. It's the second string. So this is how it's going to go in. So let's put that back in and we'll check it again. So we are back to our tuning check. All six strings have been tuned to concert. Now we're going to check that seventh fret because we've moved things at the bridge. As soon as you move something, then you've got to recheck it. See? And... Okay, so that is now seven cents flat. It's the A string. That is three cents flat. And octave. That is seven cents flat. Because we're right at the very edge of that saddle, we need to cantilever that note. Third string, seventh fret, and it's octave. Same deal again. It's four cents flat, so it needs to move forward. Well, it can't. We're right on the edge of that original bridge slot. Second string, and it's it's octave. Well, it is four cents flat. Now, there's lots of room on this to come forward. That's not an issue. So, our first string. Yeah, it's three cents flat. Okay, so you can see we have run out of real estate. The low E and the A string, I think we're going to be able to squeak by within the confines of the original slot. The D and the G string will come ahead of the original slot. The B string will be within the confines of that original slot, no problem. The first string, three cents flat, at best it may come right to the leading edge. By the way, I have a piece of foam un underneath that metal spiral frame uh, so that we don't mar the top, of course. Well, we're into a compensated cantilevered saddle. No way around it. Let's get started. I want to bring you in close to kind of show you a detail that I've started doing the last couple of years. So I'm giving you an overhead view of this because uh, I'm cutting this back to the line. So that gives you an idea of how much displacement we've had past the saddle slot to get this to line up perfectly. So this is the final geometry for the cantilevered compensated bridge saddle. Before we get onto the compensated knot, I just want to demonstrate once again with the tuning fretted seventh fret note and its fretted corresponding octave. There we go. Here's our second last tuning check. So I'm fretting the 12th fret note. Adjust that note until it's in tune with your tuner. 12th fret fretted and open. Three cents sharp. Let's see if that does it for us. That did it. So here's our A string. And it's four cents sharp. Let's check that. That'll 
will do it. Next, our D. Ooh, that just barely needs to be touched. Let's see if that does it for us. And that does it. Third string. Same thing as the D, just give it a quick touch. Okay, let's see how we do with that. No, it's still a little sharp. Come back just a little bit more. Okay, here's what we got. That's done. Second string. Oh, it's going to come back a good four cents. Let's see how we did with that. And that's that one. Last string. That's well, also four cents sharp. do with that. Now we're ready for the very last step. I did use this brass shim stock before. I don't know why I stopped using it. It works awesome. So that is done. Well these are the final values. 11 to 52 at concert pitch for this Taylor scale length. So now we're going to trim it back and smooth it out. Well, I flush that up on the stationary disc sander, turning it on with the air switch, of course, the foot switch. Now back to the radius sander one more time. Okay, we have arrived. Okay, now I'll just soften any sharp edges, final polish, and glue it into place. Then we can actually pick it up and play it. Just when you think you're all done, and then you discover this. This needs a fret dress at the neck junction. The treble side's fine. You can hear that? This area right here needs to be leveled, recrowned, and polished. Well, as we do the wrap up on this tailor, there's a couple of things I want to point out once again. If you'll notice now, the strings are equidistant from the outside of the fingerboard to the outside diameter of the first string and the sixth string all the way along. At the beginning of the video these strings were like right here. I am almost certain that whoever was on the floor of the Taylor factory that day picked out the wrong nut spacing. Something went awry, I don't know what, but it's perfect now. I need to take a second to explain this because the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to dress the frets in this area here as I mentioned earlier. If you remember back in the video we adjusted this shim to bring this portion of the fingerboard down and we actually avoided doing a fret dress here. But this is a different issue. 
the frets that need to be dressed on the base side are ahead of that neck to body junction so there's no way around it we've got the lay of the neck beautiful got the action perfect silky smooth to play perfectly in tune end to end we just need to do that final fret dress here level crown and polish and I can give Dan a call. He can come pick up this guitar and play it perfectly regulated and perfectly in tune for the first time since he owned it. Mm. Oh, there we go. Popped another string. And this is all par for the course. You know, when you're going through this calibration process, you're tightening and loosening and tightening and loosening and checking. And the strings were not meant to be tightened and loosened that many times. I think this is this is now the third first string uh, that we're going through, but that's fine. We're just going to pull these strings out of the way, and we'll put a brand new 11th house string on. When we're ready to tune it up again, we really are on the home stretch now, and we're just going to take care of this, tune it back up for the last time, and Dan will finally be able to just relax and play his guitar. So this is the scrub block that you've seen me use so many other times. It comes in your kit, your fretting kit. And we've got the 320 grit paper to basically eradicate all traces of the leveling file. This is our compensated saddle, and this is our compensated nut. I thought I would at least go through the final tuning check. The tuner doesn't lie, you can see for yourself. 7th fret note and corresponding 19th fret or octave all the way across. Fifth string. Fourth string. Third string, second string, and finally the first string. So the final test before we go in and actually plug it in and you can hear it for yourself, chord to chord, we'll play the fretted 12th fret note, the open string, and the first fret fretted note all the way across. And second string. And first string. And the first string. Now we can go in and play some chords. Okay, we're finally ready to just relax and play this thing. So I'll go through my usual sort of garden variety chords. First position, G. All our A major chords. B major. C major. D major. E major. F major. G major. This is a progression you've seen me use before. I'll use it again because I think it illustrates 
the accuracy of the intonation across the entire span of the neck um, in different keys. From what I understand, I've talked to a couple of people that had attended seminars early in the game uh, for the original sort of compensated nuts and apparently they were sort of key centric. In other words, if you were playing in the key of E and the key of A, they worked, but if you went to C sharp minor or another key, they didn't quite work. So I don't know why that is and it's not the approach that I've taken. I like to illustrate pl playing in two or three different keys, just uh, just a brief little chord progression in different keys and you can hear how the guitar string to string, fret to fret, chord to chord, that it doesn't matter what key you're in. I don't readjust the tuning for any particular key because it's already been calibrated end to end. So here's key of C. The progression I use is one, seven, three, six, two, five, one. I can also go one, seven, three, six, four, five, one. So if I do that, we basically cover uh, all of the diatonic chords of any given key. So here we go, C. One, seven, three, one, six, two, five, one. Or you could go four, one. So here's A. One, seven, three, six, two, five, one. Here's E major. One, Seven, three, six, two, five. One other way to check the um, intonation along the entire span of the neck is to take a simple chord like C. And you've seen me do this before too, but I want to do it so you can hear this Taylor. That simple C form. So, eighth position. So another check that I use for verifying intonation is using intervals, and you've seen me do this before. So I'll start with the tenth. You've all heard this before, Paul McCartney's Blackbird. So tenths are a really great interval for the guitar because it's a wide interval. It's basically a third moved up an octave that lets you kind of orchestrate on the guitar. You can jump from one set of strings to the next, like. even three sets of tenths. The other thing that's neat about the tenths is it really leaves room for some sort of orchestration on the guitar. Because it's such a wide interval, uh, you can treat it as two different voices. So it could be a cello and a flute or something, right? But Descending voice. The other thing I like to do is add a middle voice, so
So now that we've got three voices, any one of those voices could be a moving voice. You'd have that middle voice as an ascending voice. You get the idea. You know, I've enjoyed playing this acoustically so much I completely forgot I could plug it in. So that's what I've done. I've looped a, a progression in, um, in B minor. 